data management. So it's critical to maintain your data. Of course, we all need to maintain our data. I've lost data before and nearly wanted to commit suicide. It was horrible. I had a disk, I had a hard drive that had three albums on it that I was working on simultaneously. One was just completed and I just mixed it and gave the band reference CDs. The other one was about two thirds of the way through and the third album was just, we just finished tracking. And I walk in the next morning and everything's great, just as usual, turn on the computer, boot up the hard drive, and I hear click, 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 uh-oh. The drive didn't mount on the desktop. I was like, oh no. So I went online and I found this data recovery company in San Francisco, and I packed the hard drive in multiple layers of bubble wrap and pe you know styrofoam peanuts and I just made the nicest package and I sent it to them and their cost to recover data could have gone up to like forty five hundred dollars to re recover the data on the disk and I was willing to pay anything and they were up in the Bay Area and across the way in this industrial park was Google and the guy I was talking to at the data recovery place he said Oh, you should see it. Sometimes guys from Google come over and they're in suits and they're like crying, bringing their hard drives to us. So obviously I wasn't the only one not to back up. I'm sure that they've lost their share of data over that. So once they looked at the disk, they had found that the disk was totally destroyed and not usable at all. And the way disks work is very fascinating. It's like one plastic piece, just like a CD, except on top is magnetic material like a piece of tape. And then above that magnetic material is a little arm that spits out magnetic flux, like a tape head would. And the disc spins and spins and spins very fast. And this thing moves around and spits out magnetic data, zeros and ones, on different sectors of the disc. And then there's a directory on the disc that keeps track of where all the data is stored. And then later it reads it back and reconstructs it in your computer fascinating process, unbelievably technical. How they got to be able to do that was pretty cool to me. I mean, that's a feat of genius, whoever thought that up. And the problem with my disc was the little arm that hangs over the disc, and the disc is spinning at 7200 RPM. Um, something mechanically broke, and it landed on the disc. And it just lathed off all of the magnetic material, and it was just in shreds when they opened up the disc. So there was no way to get the data back. And when they called me to tell me, I remember it was right around Christmas. I was like, I was like so upset. I, I was like freaked out. And then I had to call the bands and say, you know, whoever said you could only do it once. And it took me literally three months to re-record everything I'd done. So it was horrible. Luckily, the one band that I'd made CDs for, reference CDs, I got a hold of one of the guys and I didn't tell him anything. I said, hey, can you bring that back? I want to hear that. So he brought back the mix. I imported it into my computer and mastered that, and that was their record. So I could never remix it. I lost everything else. Needless to say, it makes a really good case for knowing how to store data and store data properly. And it's not as easy as it sounds. I know you guys all have computers, and I'm sure that you don't think much about it because power up your computer, it works, and just like your phone. But think about it. If you opened up your computer and the screen was blank, what would you do? Like, I've got all my stuff in there. Or your phone. I don't even remember phone numbers anymore. Like, how would I find people again? It'd be horrible. It's critical to maintain your data. Your data is a master generation material. It's only one, like the master. And data longevity is extremely important. So how long is your data safely stored and how long will it be used in the future? That's a question that I can't answer. This is a question to sort of make you think a little bit is that, okay, so let's say you do all this backup just perfectly and you're working on Pro Tools or Logic or whatever you're doing and then you come back five years later because you want to remix your song because it's really great and now you got a record deal and they want that recording and you go to Pro Tools and you load it up and Pro Tools goes, I don't know what this is. The program's changed. They can't read this data anymore. What's a WAV file? Right? Then all of a sudden you're like, 
what am I going to do? Because things have changed so drastically, people will find CDs 25 years from now and go, what are these things? It's really important to not just back it up, but to also migrate it to the newest formats. Otherwise, pretty soon you'll turn around and your computer won't be able to understand it. I had so many documents that I thought were great and backed up. They were on three and a half inch floppy disks and I was using my little Mac, my SE30, you know, the five inch screen. And I had all my lyrics on it and all sorts of financial information and client information. And then one day the program wouldn't read it anymore. That taught me a big lesson. Data integrity, whether the data is stored faithfully, will errors occur in time? They always will occur. Data errors are always going to happen. In fact, I have a friend that works at Pixar, and a lot of those movies that they make are digitally generated. And the master lives on a silicon graphics computer somewhere, huge, massive computer. And that's the master information, all zeros and ones. It's not on film, zeros and ones. And once the master's done, they transport it to a computer that's running full time, evaluating errors and correcting them. So they've got a program just running full time, sort of keeping this master on life support. Otherwise, the zeros will turn to ones and ones will turn to zero, and errors will happen. So they've got a whole program just to support the data the way it was supposed to be. So I thought about this a lot about data longevity and storage, and I came up with this. Longevity is inversely proportional to the ease of commercial distribution. So think about that. 2000 BC, people were writing on stones. Last thousands of years, the Rosetta Stone still exists. Paper can last hundreds of years if it's acid free. Film can last 100 to 200 years. Audio tape can last 50 to 100 years. I've done a lot of tape restoration that are really old tapes that I've made play again. Digital CDRs, five to seven years, if burned slowly. Flash storage, two to five years. So your MP3s are just send them off into the internet and they're in the ether and then they're gone. So it's great because you can, from your computer, transport all this music to millions of people at once and distribute easily, you couldn't do that with a piece of stone. But the stone will last a lot longer. That's something to consider when you're backing up your data. Tape is a really good backup storage device because it actually lasts a long time. But it also has its problems. You have to handle it properly, use tape, magnetic tape reels and cassettes in, in a clean environment, avoid contamination of dirt and dust, fingerprints, food, cigarette smoke, ash, airborne pollutants. Take care of not to drop your tapes. Be sure not to drive your, drop your hard drives. That would be a real problem. I accidentally dropped one of my computers and dented it, and I brought it to the repair guy. I said, it still works. It's fine. Don't worry. It looks funny, but he's like, it'll fail. The hard drive will eventually fail just from that, that jostling of the hard drive, even though it's not failing yet, so be careful back it up every day. So there's a couple rules for storage for tapes here that I, I brought about. Not that you all have tapes, but it's interesting because there are a lot of archival tapes, you know, lectures from very famous people that are on tape, all sorts of historic tapes that aren't only on film, but they're on magnetic tape. And this is sort of, you know, the size of tape versus debris. Right here in the middle is a human hair. So the smallest amount of dust can really upset how the tape works. And then I gave you a little chart just for your interest as to the perfect temperature and relative humidity to store tapes at. And this has been analyzed by a lot of people and a lot of societies. And in time, tape breaks down to what they call sticky tape syndrome. And what it is is that the binder starts breaking down and it starts getting to be sticky and so you play it on your machine and all of the magnetic material starts falling off of it, which is what you don't want to have happen. So you need to bake them very low temperature. I think Ampex recommends 122 degrees in a convection oven for 48 hours and to dehumidify them. And then all of a sudden, tape rebinds itself and you can play it. 
And you can do that over 50 different times. And it, it works perfectly without any fidelity, without any fidelity loss. And it's kind of like, I don't know if anybody's had potato chips sit out in a humid environment. And then you taste them and they're like not crunchy anymore. You take them, if you put them in an oven at a low temperature for a few minutes, all of a sudden they get crunchy again because the humidity comes out. Same sort of thing with the uh, sticky tape syndrome. I, I do a lot of that tape restoration. It's actually a really good career right now because not everybody has a two, you can't find a two-inch tape machine. And not everybody knows how to you know, bring tapes back to life. And I started this program at the Getty Research Institute, which was tape preservation since they had so many historic tapes. And I was doing all their work for a while there. And then they just decided they'd build a whole department. So now, if you need tapes restored, the Getty Research Institute can do that for you. But they have a whole department to do that for museums, for historic societies. I mean, for example, in Chicago, they've got all these tapes from the 30s, 40s, 50s of all of these historic blues and jazz musicians that they have in their vaults. And they don't know what to do with them because they can't play them. So they have to take them to somebody like me who can take them one by one repair them, make them play again, and transfer them into another format where they could you know, digitally disseminate. 